0942, Commonwealth v. Stephen Smith. Morning, Your Honors. If it pleases the Court, Joseph Vassone for the appellant. I'm going to ask you to speak into your microphone a little yes. bit closer. To bring, yes, that would be great. There we Thank go. You. Again, Joseph Vassone for the appellant, Mr. Smith. We have two issues today for the Court's consideration. The first one is that the evidence was insufficient to convict him of an intentional assault and battery. What the evidence would suggest is that he intentionally engaged in an extremely reckless act of waving a knife in front of his girlfriend. And he didn't intentionally come in contact with her with the knife. She tried to swat the knife away from her, which is understandable. And in doing so, she cut her hand very badly. But he had no intention of making contact, a battery. The Commonwealth argues that even if you're right about that, we can sustain the conviction on a recklessness theory. So what do you say to that? Well, I think I argued in my brief that it does amount to a reckless assault and battery. It's not an intentional assault and battery. But the Commonwealth is saying you can prove assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon on either theory, so we can still affirm. Well, you could affirm as he's being – he's now convicted of a reckless assault and battery. But I don't think you can say it was an intentional because he didn't have the intent to make contact with this woman. He was just trying to – Is reckless assault and battery a different crime from intentional assault and battery? Yes. What statute is it? I'm sorry? What statute is reckless assault and battery? Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. But – Aren't they just two different theories of proving the offense? Well, you have to have the intent to do a battery. I mean, that's what assault and battery is. You have to intend to make physical contact with someone else. Do you have to intend to wave the knife or do you have to intend to make the contact? No. The intent to wave the knife is reckless. Okay? He didn't – he recklessly did something, and he did that intentionally. He meant to wave the knife. He meant to hold the knife. What he didn't mean to do is he didn't mean to make contact with her body. And he – and that's evidenced by the fact that, you know, he didn't thrust. She went like – had she not done this with her hand to try to get the knife out of her face, you know, it would have been, you know, just a simple assault. The Commonwealth argues, though – I mean, at this point, he's straddling her. He's moving the knife in a way that she felt the need to block it with her hand in front of her face. So why is that not sufficient to support a conviction for intentional assault and battery? Because he didn't have the mens rea, the intent to make contact. If he did, he would have stabbed her. He was just waving the knife. Extremely reckless, but he intentionally engaged in reckless conduct, which is the waving of the knife. Well, but he said that she felt like he was intentionally threatening her, and she felt a need to protect herself. Why is that not on him under an intentional assault and battery theory? Well, it's reckless assault and battery. It's not intentional assault and battery because he didn't have the – to prove intentional assault and battery, you have to prove that he intended to make contact. Reckless, you have to prove that he intended to engage in a reckless act. He certainly intended to engage in a reckless act because he was waving this very sharp knife, you know, inches away from the woman's face. And that's – so he intentionally engaged in a reckless act, but he had no intent to make physical contact with her. That's what you need. You're not disputing that he intended to wave the knife in front of her face in a threatening manner? Yes. But he never intended to make contact with her body with the knife. If he didn't – if he did, if he poked her with it and made – I mean, he did make contact, but that wasn't him making contact. That was her making contact, trying to get the knife away from her. He didn't have the mens rea 
to go and stab her. If he did, he would have, you know, made some kind of movement directly, so directly was, at her. He was just this doing was this. This was a bench trial. This was a bench trial, so we don't really have, so we don't have, you know, jury instructions like we would normally have in a case that was tried before a jury, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you to, if you could clarify for me, I don't think I quite understood your answer to Justice Henry's question in the beginning of the argument, which is, if you agree that the evidence is sufficient to convict your client of assault and value dangerous weapon on a theory of reckless conduct, where, what are you seeking to obtain here? Well, Why? he wasn't, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay, I mean, I, I don't know, what, what, what's the remedy? Well, le reckless, I don't believe, is a lesser included offense. I brought it up just. No, but let's say it's separate theories. It's separate a separate theories. theory, right. And, and they, if you had a jury, you would, you would, you would instruct on both. Right, so you, you have, have to have sufficient evidence of both if you didn't have a, a, a special verdict. Right. In this case, we don't have that because it was right. a bench trial. And so the evidence is insufficient to convict him of what he was charged with in the complaint, which is an intentional assault, well, is an assault and battery, an intentional, intentional version. Had they, had, he, had they asked, and I don't know why the lawyer would, if he says, you know, can we charge the jury on a separate theory, but it's, it's not a lesser included. So he was never charged with reckless assault and battery. He was just in charge with intentional assault and battery. Well, and based on the, what the facts are, you know, even under, under Lattimore, uh, he's not guilty because he, no, he had no mens rea. He had no intent to make physical contact. He was, his only intention was, was to frighten her with that knife. She made the contact. Had she not done that with her hand, there would have been no battery. Could you talk about the adjutant issue a little? I'm sorry? Your second issue about adjutant. Yes, the first adjutant. aggressor, yes. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, moved orally at trial to uh, strike all the first aggressor uh, evidence uh, because they said the defendant did not present any uh, evidence that, of self-defense. His testimony was that she came at him with a knife. Uh, she hit him in the head with a, with a jar full of uh, coins. Um, so that was, that was clearly a dangerous weapon. And it, he said in his testimony he kept trying to block her thrusts, and so if you're trying to block, and then he also said he pushed her, pushed her away, and then he ran out the door, that's self-defense. Now, did well, it, usually in self-defense you say, yes, I stabbed the person and I did it because, and here he never admits that he cut her at all. Right. He never said that. Right. But the point is, is that under the standard, no matter how, as I said in my brief, no matter how off the wall your, your evidence is, you're still entitled, if you show some evidence of self-defense, you're still entitled to get that instruction of who the first aggressor was. What was so the evidence? It, the evidence is in the light most favorable to the defendant sustaining his affirmative defense. But I guess what I'm trying to understand is it doesn't seem so, he's just basically claiming an entirely different set of facts. He's not actually claiming that he hurt her. Right. He says that she attacked him and he had physical evidence to prove it. He had medical evidence. He had physical evidence of showing cuts that he had been cut by something. It was arguably the, the glass shattering in his face when she hit him with the so, I mean, she had to do something. Otherwise, where would he have gotten those well, so injuries? Well, he was sitting at the kitchen table cutting himself, as some people do. Um, the uh, he also had cuts around his eyes, too, Judge. If he was cutting himself, he was cutting himself over here. But not so the when the court said it was striking the adjunct testimony or evidence, what exactly do you think was struck? The uh, evidence that the uh, victim, in this case, uh, had prior incidents of, of violent conduct, which would show that, she, you know, by inference that she was the first aggressor, not him. What about the evidence that the defendant had previously tried to stab his ex-wife with a screwdriver? Was that struck too? I'm sorry? What about the evidence that the defendant had yeah. previously tried to stab his, his ex-wife with a screwdriver? Yes. That was struck, too, because that was also adjutant evidence. Uh, I don't believe that was I believe the only adjutant evidence for the defendant was what his 
girlfriend had done, what she had done, which she engaged in violent conduct on a previous occasion. I don't recall the, that that being part of the act. That certainly wouldn't be adjutant evidence, you know, in his favor. We, we, did, did anyone ever ask the judge to make a ruling of law as to whether or not a self-defense um, defense was available to the defendant for things that happened, including the hitting with the, the jar of whatever it was, coins? No. No, that's not So we don't, do we know from the record whether the judge considered self-defense? Well, he just, I mean, the record is somewhat nebulous because the judge said, I don't really see where, you know, you have self-defense here. And I think, I think the lawyer was trying to stay away from the knife issue because he didn't want, you know, obviously you don't want to put a knife in your client's hands because that's, that's, that's certainly no help to you. It's, you know, it's a great, a great help to the Commonwealth. So he was defending himself. He was defending himself against, you know, he said she had a knife and that she also hit him with a jar of, of coins, which would substantiate the injuries around the eye because she said he was bashed in the side of the head with the, with the jar of, uh, of coins. But he never admits, yes. he never admits that he hurt her. So right. that's the part. So I'm like, so where is there a self-defense claim? He just seems to be advancing an alternative theory. Well, the defense is that he, he raised his hands. He was trying to block himself against, against her coming after him. In other words, so, what he's saying. You're right. But then, so what's the, what's his theory about how she ended up with a, some significant cuts on one of her hands? I would assume that when she took the jar, a glass jar, and bashed it against his head, that that, you know, that caused right, lacerations. That's not self-defense. Again, that's just an alternative theory of what happened. The that's not him saying, yes, I hurt this person, but I was defending myself. He's just saying she got hurt while she was attacking him. Well, that's, yeah, that's his theory. But, I mean, he could also posit a, a self-defense if the, if, the, if the jury believes that, you know, doesn't believe him, believes her, that he was on top of her with a knife. And he could say, well, yeah, I was doing that because she initially came at me with a knife and came at me with a jar of, of coins and smashed it on my head. I mean, there's, we don't really know what the... But, well, I don't understand how the trier of fact could consider this idea that he might have been on top of her with a knife for self-defense when he never said, I was on top of her with a knife. Where would, there would be no basis for that. Right, he never, he never said that. But the right. point is, in terms of getting a self-defense instruction, you know, I, I think what the court is saying is this seems pretty preposterous. And what the case law says is, even if it is as preposterous as, as it sounds, you're right. still but entitled. Different, preposterous or not, usually in self-defense, you have to say, yes, I hurt that person, but I did it to protect myself. And he's never... Saying he I never did hurt her. He never did. I mean, he should have, but he didn't. Right. What standard do we use to decide if the judge erred or abused her discretion in striking the adjutant evidence? Well, the standard is you have to take the evidence in the light most favorable to the defendant's defense, no matter how absurd it is. That's what I said in my brief. And that's for the admissibility of adjutant evidence yes. as well as for the self-defense instruction? Well, in order to get a self-defense instruction, okay, the ju I mean, the judge decided, I'm not going to give you a self-defense instruction because, you know, you haven't provided any evidence, and I'm saying, yes, he did, and you have to take it in the light most favorable to him, not to the Commonwealth, and he didn't, he didn't do that. It, it doesn't appear he did. He, I mean, he didn't, the judge? he didn't. I'm sorry, Judge. Did you say he? Are you referring to the judge? I'm sorry. Did you? Were you referring to the judge when you said he? You yes, yes, judge? Your Honor. That he never. The judge never I said. Think, I, I, think, I think it was before Jennifer Tyne, right? This this case. Yes. All right. Um, I have 49 seconds left. If no questions. I will uh, submit on my brief. Thank you very much. Thank you for hearing me.
Members of the panel, and may it please the Court, Nicholas Atala for the Commonwealth. I represent the Commonwealth in the bench trial of this matter as well. In this case, the Commonwealth did present sufficient evidence to support an intentional assault and battery. The, Ms. Sullivan testified that the defendant was um, on page 19 of the record, holding, he was holding me, oh, he was over me, holding me down with a knife in my face, just pretending that he was going to, I don't know what he was doing, but he was going like this, and I had tried to block it while he was straddling over me, holding me down with a knife, and upon further questioning says, um, when asked uh, when moving the knife what part of her body was hit, she says, he hit my hand, my left hand. Um, clearly, uh, during that statement, um, saying that he was moving like this, she must have been making some gesture. The Commonwealth neglected to elucidate exactly what that gesture was on the record. But I think we can infer from the record what that gesture must have been. She felt she needed to block the gesture with a knife, so it's not something where he's moving the knife away. I would suggest he's straddling her. It um, must be in close proximity, going towards her face. It's probably some sort of either stabbing or, or, or kind of, uh, if you will, a psycho move towards her face. But in any event, the judge clearly saw that gesture, so there's a clear, clear inference there. Um, she also says she was blocking and the knife hit her hand, as opposed to um, my brother counsel's assertion that she was blocking the knife away. Um, her testimony is that she had her hand in front and it got hit by the knife. That, I think, would suggest is sufficient for the intentional assault and battery, even if when he initially is moving the knife, he is doing it to sort of scare her um, as to uh, whether she'll be hit with the knife in the face. He's never intending to touch her face. Once he, she puts her hand up and he moves the knife again, he therefore is doing a, an intentional act that is going to hit his, her hand. That's an intentional assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. Um, it is a general intent crime, so you don't need specific intent to touch, uh, to, uh, to inflict a particular injury on an intentional theory. Um, in any well, event. Sometimes these crimes are used later um, for purposes of, say, federal law to see if somebody is committed intentional act. So here we wouldn't know, right, because the judge didn't say. We just know that it was a conviction, but we don't know which theory it was on, right? That's correct. The judge did not specify the, the theory upon which she made the conviction. However, the judge is presumed to have instructed her correctly on, instructed herself correctly on the law for any theory that would apply on the facts. A recklessness theory would also apply on these facts if, again, the defendant was never intending to touch her but to scare her, but keeps moving the knife when her hand is blocking. He, he, clearly, it's very likely he's going to hit her, uh, her hand with the knife and cause an injury, which he did cause a significant injury that required, um, well, her testimony was 22 stitches. The medical records indicated a running suture, but in any event, a, a, a long stitching to, to repair the uh, laceration to her hand. Uh, therefore, we have a sufficient evidence under either theory uh, to support this conviction. If this case had been tried before a jury and you were arguing that a charge conference and the judge asked you if you thought if on the Commonwealth's behalf, if she should give a self-defense instruction, what would you say? I would say no, Your Honor. And I think um, partly because um, when the judge ruled striking the adjunct evidence, you specifically referenced a self-defense argument. Um, Your Honor, on page, uh, give me a moment here, uh, 71 of the record, uh, the court says, and I have to say it's not real clear from your client's testimony, particularly with the charge of assault and battery dangerous weapon, how he was acting in self-defense. So I'm going to allow the Commonwealth's motion to strike all the adjunct evidence. Does the defendant have to testify to raise self-defense? No, it can be inferred from the evidence, um, even from just the, if there was no uh, evidence presented by the defendant, from the Commonwealth's evidence. I don't think there's any evidence here from the Commonwealth portion of the case that would raise a self-defense claim. So could the trier of fact believe her testimony that he waved a knife at me and his testimony that she came at me first and put those together and come up with in the light most favorable to the, of the, to the defendant with self-defense? There may be cases where you can stitch together testimony like that. I made a, an attempt in my brief to do so, but I really don't think that's a logical stitching given the the drastic differences between both of their accounts, I don't think any real fact finder could find a way to say the truth is somewhere in between. It's either her story or his story, and there's really no way to kind of, because he explicitly denies ever touching the knife, and specifically, um, actually, after the adjunct evidence was struck, the Commonwealth on uh, cross-examination did clarify with him, uh, according to, your, this is page 74 of the record, according to your testimony, you never grabbed the knife from Ms. Sullivan, correct? He said correct. So, uh, so, but let's pause on that for a minute. Like, let's say you are being attacked and you push the person away and run out and you don't actually really see what happened, right? But, I mean, maybe you pushed their hand in it and they cut themselves. So, why is that not enough to raise self-defense? I mean, he, he doesn't have, does he have to say, I stabbed her? Or maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he, like, just assume for a moment that 
you know, when he pushed her hand, it caused the knife to cut her. He doesn't know because he was running out and things were chaotic. I, uh, if he specifically testified that I pushed the hand that had the knife, which could have caused her to hit herself with a knife, perhaps, Your Honor. I don't think we have really that kind of testimony in this case. I think here he really only he, he gives some general statements about uh, blocking her attacks um, and running away from her with the knife and then pushing her to get out the door. He doesn't say where he pushed her to get out the door. Um, I think the inference there is he pushes towards her body just to get, get away from her. He's really not specific about what, what way he pushed her. Um, there perhaps could be a way where um, that pushing in self-defense could be a self-defense to the ABDW, but I think the Clark case here is instructive that uh, for the ABDW it really has to be um, self-defense of using the knife. In that case, the defendant claimed the victim was uh, attacking him with a knife and he grabbed the knife away, but then never said he attacked her with the knife. He said he pushed her, and so um, he never gave an explanation as to how she could have received uh, injuries from the knife in the way that she described, and so the court said there was no self-defense, or did not grant a self-defense uh, instruction in that case. Which case was that? That was Commonwealth v. Clark. I cite that at a page, um, uh, I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, yeah, but in Clark, the defendant admitted he struck the victim in anger, and there's, doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to be admitting that in his tale of what happened. That's correct, Your Honor. I think the, the important part of the Clark case, though, is the defendant never claims to have, um, struck her with the knife. There was no self-defense with the knife at all. And that, so the court ruled that there was no um, availability of self-defense instruction with regards to an ABDW charge because he, you can't have self-defense on ABDW unless you're using the weapon or the weapon's involved in some way. If you're saying he's really um, essentially not providing uh, self-defense for the actus reus charged, he's giving an alternate account with a different actus reus. It'd be like somebody testifying on a larceny case or a shoplifting case, I didn't steal the iPhone they're charging me with stealing. I did happen to steal a video game. Well, that's a different act. That's not the same item. That, well, that's, you know. I mean, but I think the, uh, the, what he's really arguing is that she was trying to hurt him one way or the other. And so, you know, if there's evidence that she had, in fact, attacked another person she was dating previously, he's saying, she attacked me, and I pushed her away, and I don't know how she got injured. She could have cut herself, or I could have pushed her arm, but I don't know. But, but the point is, is that she was vindictive enough to try to hurt me, and one way to hurt me would be to get me convicted of this crime. Uh, Your Honor, I just don't think from his testimony, he doesn't testify to ever seeing a cut on her, to, to any, any way that his actions could have cut her. I think the account that he gives really is a separate account of the events of the night that don't involve her really getting injured at all. I think um, the, the, in, in closing argument, the uh, court asked defense counsel, well, how did she get these injuries? And he says, honestly, I don't know, because um, there's really no evidence. His, his, I think his implication there was that there was a time from the evidence, both from both parties' testimony, that the defendant um, was away from the victim. He had left. Uh, he was arrested, I think, or, or contacted by police about a mile or two away. Um, so there was a period of time between when this incident occurred and when the police arrived where the victim was alone without the defendant. Um, you know, maybe by his argument she could have cut herself at that point, but this really wasn't a case where he argued that his actions caused an injury with the weapon. What about his the defendant's uh, testimony? Um, she, was j just, she was on top of me it was like face to face. It was like combat. She come at me and just come at me with whatever she could get her hands on. How did that make you feel? I was nervous. Is that enough for self-defense? Again, not on this ABDW charge because he is charged with using the knife. So it's if he was, um, if, the, if this, the act charged here was uh, using the knife on her. So on that act, he does not have self-defense. If he was charged with, say, uh, a general push or a general shove or a general A and B that wasn't involving the knife, um, then he would have a self-defense argument. And I would argue here, Your Honor, that the count of AB family household member really was for the same act, the use of the knife. It just had a different element. So the same act would be charged in two different ways, which it was. What if he grabbed the jar out of her hand and hit her, hit her back with it after she hit him with it? Um, I think, Your Honor, in that case, I would suggest that he doesn't have a self-defense to the ABDW because he's using a different, 
different weapon. It's sort of, it's a denial of the act that's being charged. He's, he's giving a different account of events as opposed to, um, you know, really giving, uh, um, saying, I did essentially what was alleged, but I had a good reason for it. He's denying doing what was alleged and said I did something different. Uh, that, that would definitely be a closer case, Your Honor, but I think here we have a much bigger gap between what the act is alleged that he should be, that the Commonwealth argues he should be convicted of and what he's alleging he did and why his actions were justified. He's saying he did different acts that were justified, not the acts alleged, and saying that those were justified. So um, when the court said it was striking the adjutant testimony or evidence, what exactly do you think was struck? What was struck was um, the defense counsel's initial inquiry on her as to her prior uh, incident with her boyfriend using the knife. It was also striking the Commonwealth's uh, redirect of her about um, allegations in a restraining order that she had been presented with. The Commonwealth didn't make an argument that there would be an other admissible purpose for that. I think we even raised it again in our closing. But the judge's ruling, I think, is very clear that she was only admitting that for action purposes and was not considering it for the verdict. Uh, further evidence from the defendant that, um, uh, of his knowledge of some of her violence that would also uh, struck. But essentially it was the testimony from her about her prior case and also about her testimony about the um, the allegations in the restraining order, all of that was struck. Um, you, well, so do you, okay, so the defendant says he doesn't think the evidence that the defendant had previously assaulted his then estranged wife was struck. Do you agree with that? Um, I believe, no, the, the evidence that he, um, he had assaulted his estranged wife was definitely struck. That was clearly um, um, struck from the evidence as well, Your Honor. I think because, again, the court ruled... Um, I don't know if you give me a moment to try to find the uh, location, but I believe when the court was hearing that evidence on redirect from the Commonwealth, the court said, I'm after, after her testimony, I'm taking this for adjutant only or first aggressor only. So the court clearly limited to the, the admissibility of the evidence. I made some argument at closing um, about other possible admissibility, but I don't believe the court accepted that argument as to other admissibility, other basis of admissibility for that evidence. So I think, the, obviously, the prejudice, if it's not for adjutant evidence, uh, to rebut his action evidence would have been, the prejudice would have outweighed any probative value at that point. And do you think that his theory of self-defense was struck? Yes, I believe she clearly was, if this were a jury trial, would not have given an instruction on self-defense. And that was the basis for striking the action evidence because there was not a sufficient claim of self-defense. It was not a, um, so although the Commonwealth did say it was an abuse of discretion in our brief, I actually believe that if there's no self-defense, there's no discretion to admit the evidence. You have to have the self-defense first there's still discretion to deny it if it's overly prejudicial or just not connected. Um, I think the Commonwealth reason we, prior to trial, uh, assented to the defendant's um, motion for adjunct evidence was because we realized that if he made a self-defense claim, her incident of using a knife would be clearly uh, more probative than prejudicial and, and relevant to his defense. If there's no further questions from the panel, I would rest in my briefs. One moment and I'll check. Okay. Thank you both very much for your arguments. Thank you, Your Honor. Appreciate it.